Good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Water's Edge, a place where everyone is welcome. And if you're live with us today, we're so excited to have you here. And if you're online with us this morning, make sure to check us out on Facebook and YouTube, and feel free to like, share, and comment. And now that we're back live, we're in need of volunteers. So whether you've volunteered in the past or God put it on your heart to volunteer now, we really need volunteers in the nursery and other places in the church. So make sure to hit us up at watersedgevolunteer at gmail or text your contact info to 337-352-2443 and we'll get you plugged in. We have a full experience for you guys, so get ready for worship and a message from Pastor Tony. the world but it couldn't fill me man's empty praise treasures of faith were never enough and you came along and put me back together Here in your love Oh, there's nothing better than you There's nothing better than you Oh, there's nothing Nothing is better than you It's still God in the valleys And there's not a place Your mercy and grace Won't find me again
Man, I really enjoyed worship this morning. The Water's Edge Band really rocked it out. And by the way, if you'd like to partner with us through giving, here's a few ways you can do that. You can visit us at watersedgegathering.com or you can download the Water's Edge app and simply click on Give. You can also text your dollar amount to 337-223-9003 or you can mail a check to P.O. Box 572, Lake Charles, Louisiana, 70602 or 2760 Power Center Parkway, Lake Charles, Louisiana, 70607. Now open your hearts and prepare your minds for a message from Pastor Tony. What's up, everybody? Good morning. Welcome to our Sunday morning Water's Edge uh, online worship experience. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. Thank you so much for tuning in. And for those of you that share this link with other people during the week, thank you for doing that. Continue to do that if you think it may help someone. For those of you that continue to give and you being generous, thank you for that also. It helps us love more people and help more people and serve more people and feed more people. Thank you for being a part of our mission and our vision and helping us go forward. Uh, today we wrap up with our series that we've been doing over the last several weeks about having dignity and pride in our local community. Our local community, as everyone knows, that has been through so very much and the people in our city and the people in our surrounding communities that have been through so very much. We've seen difficult times. We've been through. We've endured through difficult times. We've rebuilt. We're still trying to rebuild. We've come back. We're still trying to come back through difficult times. But I firmly believe this, and like I told you last week, you have to really trust the providence of God. God has us still here for a reason. God has us still here for a purpose. You're still in this community for a reason. Our church is still here for a purpose, and this is what that is. It's to love on our city and to love on our community and to make God's love and God's heart visible to our city and to make the kingdom of Jesus visible to our city by inspiring a sense of dignity and pride back into our city. When I was a little boy in elementary school, when school was over, I would get so excited when I would go out to the Circle Drive and I would either see my mom's car there waiting to pick me up or my grandma, my mom's mom's car, there waiting to pick me up. So sometimes my mom would pick me up, but if my mom had errands to run after work, then my grandma would pick me up. I loved going to my grandma Scott's house and my papa Scott's house, man. It was really cool. They kept those glass old school bottles of Coke and Dr. Pepper. They were really, really cold, pure glass, man. That Coke tasted so good. And my grandma would always fix me cheese and crackers and we'd watch movies in the VCR. And I just thought it was the coolest thing. And they had the coolest animals, the coolest dogs. They had a little dog named Rambo that was a terrier and this big dog named Flywheel. Well, on this day, when I, after school, when I went out to the Circle Drive, I noticed that my mom's car wasn't there and my grandma's car wasn't there, but my grandma's neighbor car was there. And I was really, really good friends with him and really good friends with their grandson. And his name was Kent. And so I really, really got along with him. And so we were all close. And so my grandma's neighbor picked me up. And when she picked me up from school, she said, your mom is still running errands after work. And your uh, papa and your mama, they're not home yet, but they'll be home in about 15 or so minutes. So I'm just going to pick you up from school and drop you off. And the doors unlock you and go inside. And by the time we get there, they'll just be five minutes away. And you can just wait for them inside. And I was like, OK, that sounds cool. I think I was in fourth grade. And so she picked me up and she brought me to my grandparents' house and it was right down the road from the school. And so she dropped me off and my papa at that time had uh, worked offshore. And when he worked offshore on the oil rigs, he'd picked up this old dog that he found out there and he named it Flywheel. It was a big dog and I really, really loved that dog. That dog was really cool, very playful, very friendly. But that was always when my papa was around. He just seemed like a great dog, always very friendly, always very nice and cool and kind. But my papa was always around. Well, on this day, it was just me and Flywheel. And so I get out the car and I start walking across the yard and I notice that Flywheel's coming around the back of the house and he notices me. And so I'm walking towards the house and he's walking towards me. I get closer to the house and he gets closer towards me. I get up to the house and he gets right close to me. And as I reach for the front door, he did something that he's never done before with me. He got down really low and he started growling and he jumped at me and he pinned me up against my grandparents' house. Now remember, I'm in fourth grade, and so I'm a little kid, and I'm thinking, oh, 
this is where it all ends, man, right here in my grandparents' front yard and no one's around. And so Flywheel pins me up against the house and he puts his mouth around my neck. And I figured out very quickly that if I tried to move or make a noise, then he would clamp down pretty hard. But if I just stayed still, he would let up, but he would still hold me there. And so I just stood there, frozen, with his mouth around my neck. And every time I would make just the smallest move, he would clamp down just a little bit and he would growl at me. And I was full of so much fear. And then about two minutes later, my grandparents drove up. My papa got out of his vehicle, flywheel let go, started licking me and wanted to play. But here's the deal. He was only doing what he was taught to do, and that was to guard my grandfather's property. He didn't know that I wasn't a threat. I mean, I'm family, but he didn't know that on that day. All he knew was that my papa wasn't there and that his job, his mission, was to protect my papa's property no matter what. Well, my papa ended up getting rid of flywheel because of that. But that's what guard dogs do. Guard dogs guard. And if they feel like you're threatening what they're guarding, then they attack. They guard and they attack. And listen to me. Sometimes religion and sometimes church and sometimes people who go to church can be the same way. They act more like guard dogs instead of people who invite and welcome all into the house of God. And so today as we wrap this series up, I'd like to just share my heart with you about church and how I feel about church and what's on my heart about church. And I'd like to start off with a very, very interesting passage in the scripture. It's a parable or a story that Jesus makes up to illustrate a point, a point about God's heart and God being a loving father. And so this is what parables were in the Bible. The everyday definition of a parable would be this. A parable is a simple story used to illustrate a moral or a spiritual lesson. But a better, a better way to understand the parable stories of Jesus would be this way. Jesus would tell an earthly story to illustrate a heavenly truth. He would tell an earthly story to illustrate the heart of God. So on this day, Jesus tells a few stories and they all illustrate the same point. And he starts off in this way, Luke chapter 15. And I'll start reading in verse 3 through verse 7 out of the New Living Translation. So Jesus told them this story. If a man has 100 sheep and one of them gets lost, What will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it back home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me because I found my lost sheep. In the same way, there's more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't even strayed away. So notice the breakdown in this story that Jesus is telling. A shepherd has 100 sheep and just one wanders away. He still has 99 sheep that are safe. And Jesus says that a good shepherd, a good loving shepherd will leave the 99 sheep that are safe and go after the one that is lost. And so in this parable that Jesus told the the good shepherd leaves the 99 and he goes after one that is lost. And it says that when he finds it, he brings it back home. He welcomes it back home to the other sheep. And he has this massive party and this massive, uh, this massive celebration. Jesus goes on to tell another story about a lady who lost a coin and she did everything she could searching through her apartment until she found that lost coin. And then a father who had two sons, an older son and a younger son, the younger son takes his money, his inheritance he goes away and he spends it on wild living and they think that he's gone and then he comes back at the end of his rope and the when the lost son returns the father has a party the father has a celebration when the lady finds the coin in her apartment it says she calls her neighbors over and they have a party they have a celebration and then Jesus goes on to say in the same way when someone who is hurting and broken and lost and searching and in need of God when they finally make their way back home to God the The angels have a celebration in heaven and they rejoice and we join in with them. But here's the question. Why did Jesus tell these stories of lost things being searched for, found, and celebrated? Because that's what these stories are about. And notice this and remember this today. These stories were about this. Lost things being searched for, found, and then celebrated. So what was his inspiration to tell these parables? Or what was the catalyst that caused Jesus to gather everyone around him and to start to tell these stories of a shepherd losing one sheep 
and leaving the 99 until he found it, of a father having two sons, losing one son when the one son returns, having a big party and celebration, and of a lady losing a coin, a steward losing a coin, and then when she finds it, having a celebration. What was the reason behind these stories? Well, we find the reason in Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 3. If you're still with me, Sam's still with you. Notice what it says. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that Jesus was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. So catch the scene. They would come to Jesus. They were attracted to Jesus like a magnet. Jesus was a magnetic force to broken people and hurting people and people that had been forced out of the synagogues and forced out of religion. So they were flocking to Jesus to hear Jesus teach. And then afterwards, Jesus was like, hey, man, everybody's tired now. Let's go get some biscuits. Let's go get some fried chicken. Let's go get some cheese fries. And they would join him. This made them so upset. And then it says, so Jesus told them this story. So notice what happened. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners were attracted to Jesus. He was a magnet to them. Why? Because they felt loved and they felt accepted and they felt welcomed and they were being attracted by and changed by his love and by his teachings. And this made the ultra religious leaders and teachers and watchdogs mad. He's compromising. He's compromising our religious standards. He's compromising our religious values. He's compromising our religious holiness. He's compromising our religious teachings. And so they were acting as guard dogs. They looked at God as something to guard and protect while Jesus and his disciples were acting as a search and rescue party. So get the scene. The ultra religious were acting as guard dogs. We're going to guard and we're going to protect our religion. We're going to guard and we're going to protect God. But here comes Jesus and his disciples and they're so searching for everyone who's been made to feel far away so they can rescue them and celebrate them. While Jesus and his disciples were welcoming people back home, the religious Pharisees were saying, you are not holy enough for us. They were guard dogs when Jesus was out there searching and finding and celebrating. Jesus told these parables not only to help hurting people among them understand that they are invited to God no matter what, Make your way to him, come just as you are. But he also knew the ultra judgmental religious were listening and he told these stories to help them understand the loving heart of God the Father. And my heart is this. The water's edge will never be a guard dog church. We will always be a search and rescue and celebration church. We will never be a you're not holy enough for us church. And we will always be a welcome back home so we can celebrate with the angels church. We will always welcome everyone. So let me ask you a few questions about this interaction that Jesus had with these religious leaders. The first question is this. If you're still with me, Sam, I'm still with you. Number one, who were the shepherd, the lady, and the father preoccupied with? They were obsessed with. They were laser focused on. They were preoccupied with that which was lost or missing. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. Their heart went towards what was lost and missing. They were laser focused on the lost sheep, lost coin, lost son. They were obsessed with who was missing. They were laser focused and preoccupied with that lost sheep lost coin, and lost son. They obviously and absolutely love the other sheep, the other coins, and the other son, but they were also safe, and they knew that they were safe. So according to Jesus, a good shepherd and a good loving father and a good steward will always be focused on what's missing and lost. And in the same way, a remarkable church will be the same way. We will always be preoccupied and laser focused on the hurting ones who have not joined us yet, but we want them to, and we want to invite them. Number two, what was the religious guard dogs focused on? They were too focused on who Jesus was hanging out with instead of why he was hanging out with them. They were just appalled that Jesus, a rabbi, a religious teacher, would have friends that were sinners. And so they practice guilt by association. And judgmental religious people always do that. They always practice guilt by association. But Jesus wasn't friends with them because he was bored and wanted to have something to do. He was friends with them because they were lonely. He was friends with them because they were friendless. They were hungry. They were hurting. They were searching. They were lost. They were empty. They were broken. They were rejected. They were marginalized. It didn't say Jesus was a 
friend of sinners because he got bored one day and he was looking for a hangout. It said he was a friend of sinners because they were made to feel lonely and he didn't want them to feel that way anymore. They were made to feel not good enough and he didn't want them to feel that way anymore. Sometimes they were broken and poor and hungry and he didn't want them to feel that way anymore and he wanted them to understand the love and the heart of God. He was being a friend to the missing and the lost sheep. Number three, if you're still with me, Sam, so still with you. What are you focused on? Do you think your job is to protect God and to guard the church, to protect it from the bad people? Or do you believe that we should open the doors to all people? Our faith in the form of a real relationship with Jesus was not given to us to keep to ourselves and to guard and to protect. And it's not just for the strong and just for the holy. It was given to us to invite other people into, to invite those who don't look like you, to invite those who don't always think like you, to invite those who have different stories, different struggles, a different past, different lives than you did. If a church can't feel welcoming and inviting to all, then it's not a Jesus movement. It's just a social club for the frozen chosen. That's all it is. And we're a Jesus movement here at the Water's Edge. Number four, Last question, if you're still with me, Sam, I'm still with you. This is what it is. How can we, the Water's Edge, be a good shepherd church? This is how. We must be focused on, laser focused on, and preoccupied with those who we know would be helped by this ministry and they're not here yet. Those who we know would be helped, dearly helped by this ministry, but they're not here yet. The addicted. The lonely, the rejected, the lost, the searching, the familyless, the powerless, and the broken. That's who we exist for. We look around and we see them here, but we also know that there's more that could be here that would be helped by this ministry. And so like good shepherds, good stewards, and good loving fathers, we're obsessed and we're focused and we're a search and rescue and celebration party. That's the type of church we want to be. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Thank you so much for hanging out. We love you. Hope to see you back next week, and we hope you have a great week. We really hope you enjoyed today's service, and we pray that the message from Pastor Tony encouraged you and helped you in some way today. And if you're moved by the message and want to hit us up on social media, you can hit us up at Water's Edge Gathering on Facebook and Water's Edge underscore LC on Instagram. You can also download our app where you can do online giving, you can listen to worship, and you can replay messages from Pastor Tony. And if you want to know more about salvation and baptism, want to volunteer, or need a prayer request, you can visit our Welcome Center and talk to our wonderful volunteers, and they'll get you plugged in. We absolutely love you guys, and make sure to come back, because the Water's Edge is a place for everyone.